Well, the difference is this. Those women whose tumors contain this, and this is what we found in that first paper, had amplification of the gene, and it only occurs in a breast cell. It doesn't occur in other areas of the body, so this is not inherited. This is something that occurs during the life of the individual, and we still don't know why. It's an area of active study in our lab and other labs around the world. But when it happens, the outcome for those patients is much different using traditional one-size-fits-all therapy. They would die in less than half the time compared to patients who didn't have this. Now, this is median survival data. Women live much longer than this, out to 20, 25 years, but the median for the wins, ones that were HER2 normal that didn't have this mistake was about 6.8 years. That's the median. So there's some much longer, some shorter. The median for those that had any amplification of this gene was less than three years. Right there, that told us we had another subtype, and this is called the HER2 subtype. And when we published that, there was some controversy, but subsequently it was proven by other investigators, and this is outcome data. Now, I'm only going to show you a few of these graphs, and we'll finish up with what this story tells us. This is a graph of patient outcome, um, and if you look to the far left, up at the top, when you start the study to follow these patients, 100% of them are alive. They've had their tumor resected, uh, and there's no visible evidence of tumor. But down on the bottom, you see time as measured in months. And you see that there are hap something happening when these graphs are going down. That means patients are having recurrences and or dying of their disease. And right now, just using molecular subtyping, we found that breast cancer breaks itself out into four major groups. The group at the top with the dark blue line are strongly hormone receptor positive. They behave the best, although there are some patients who do have recurrences and or death there. And the lighter blue are also hormone receptor positive patients, but have different parts of the recept receptor pathway broken. In the red uh, line, or orange, uh, are something called triple negative breast cancers. They are a smaller sub type of breast cancer. They can behave aggressively. Some of the women do very well with traditional therapy, but the other group uh, have a very aggressive form of the disease and recur uh, within two to three years and succumb to the disease. And it makes the whole group look bad when they're blended together because we don't know how to pick the good ones from the bad ones yet. And then the purple line, the one at the bottom, is this new group I told you about, the HER2 group. And they have the worst outcome. And they break, breast cancer globally breaks itself out into these percentages. The vast majority are hormone receptor positive breast cancers. In the blue are the HER2 positive breast cancers. And in the white are the so-called triple negative breast cancers. And when we found this HER2 alteration, the question was, and we saw that it was tracking with an aggressive outcome, the obvious question was why? Is it simply a flag that is marking aggressive breast cancers, or is it associated with aggressive disease because it's playing a role in causing that aggressive, aggressive disease? And what we can do in the laboratory, and what we've now linked to our clinics and clinical trials, is test things in the lab and then take it to clinical trials, and that's where we'll end on the story. We took this gene in the laboratory in cells, human breast cancer cells. You remember I told you we had all those cell lines in the lab. And there were plenty from patients who did not have the alteration. We cloned the gene out of a tumor where the alteration was present. And we introduced multiple copies of that gene into the breast cells. So this is a target validation study. We took these on the left, normal HER2 single copy, normal expressing and converted them into multiple copy high expression. We mimicked in the lab what was happening in patients and then asked what would happen. This simply shows we can do it. We're staining the protein with a brown stain. The more brown you have, the more of the protein you have. This is what the tumors look like uh, when they're HER2 positive. So we were able to mimic it. And now what you'll see is this. Only pay attention to the bottom right uh, corner uh, because that's, uh, there are other complexities in the thing that I won't get into tonight. But that all show the same thing. But in the bottom right-hand corner, it shows it probably graphically the best. We have the same breast cancer cell line, except one has had this alteration introduced. And they're put into a Petri dish to grow. And the ones that are in orange or yellow uh, don't have the HER2 alteration. The ones that are in green have the HER2 alteration, but have uh, the same number of copies that we see in patients. And you look at the growth of numbers of cells in time uh, in days, and you can see that the ones that are HER2 positive are growing much faster in that tissue culture plate. 
they're more aggressive. If we take them, and I, my apologies uh, at the outset to uh, animal advocates, but one of our most important tools is mice. And there's a mouse called the nude mouse. It's called the nude mouse because it doesn't have any hair. And it doesn't have any hair because of an inherited mutation in the genes that code for hair in the mouse. And it turns out, when you look at the genome of the mouse, the genes that code for hair are right next to the genes that code for immune function. So they're missing part of their immune function. That makes them an incredibly valuable tool in cancer research because you can put foreign tissue into these animals and it'll grow, it won't be rejected. So now instead of studying it in a petri dish, you can study it in a living system before you get into a patient. And these are these nude mice. They certainly look hairless, they look like the mouse version of a chihuahua. Um, and there's a couple of little lumps on the back and it's where we've inter inoculated human breast cancer cells and the one on the bottom has an inoculum of a certain number of cells, and the one on the top got exactly the same number of cells at exactly the same time. And you can see the size of the tumor is hugely different. In the, one has the HER2 alteration and one does not. And if you look at metastasis in these animals, the metastatic potential of, of that tumor on the top, even after you remove it surgically, is increased by 225%. So now we had an idea that the reason we were seeing it tracking with a bad alteration uh, outcome was because it was causing it. And so the ultimate validation came by saying if we were right, rather than throwing in a bomb, let's go after what's broken specifically, which is the HER2 alteration and too much of that protein. And so what we did was work with some antibodies in collaboration with scientists at Genentech and found antibodies that would work like a blanket that would cover that antenna on the top of the cell and cause it not to receive signals. And if we were right, we should reverse that growth. And this is now just the growth curve of the tumors in the mice. In the gray line is the tumor growth over time on the bottom, the size of the tumor uh, along the uh, line to the left. And you can see the tumor size gets greater and greater as time goes on. But if we add this antibody in that covers the receptor, you can see the tumor growth is completely suppressed. Armed with this data, we went to the US FDA and asked for permission to conduct at UCLA phase one clinical trials in women, uh, not who failed, who we failed with our traditional therapy, and said, can we try, if they have the HER2 alteration, that give this antibody. So you have to do testing and you have to do uh, the appropriate uh, safety and things. And, and the true heroines in this story are the 20 women who entered that phase one clinical trial that made an impact for women throughout the world. Um, they knew that they had aggressive disease. They knew they had a limited amount of time, but they were willing to participate in the clinical trial to try a new treatment that was directed at what was thought to be directly broken in the cell. And sure enough, uh, it did reverse the phenotype, and I'll show you that uh, data directly. So the hope was that we could translate this biologically relevant molecular information to develop more effective and less toxic therapy. Why less toxic? Well, because we're treating what's broken in the cancer cell that's not broken in the normal cell. So in theory, your treatment shouldn't have much effect on normal cells. And that's exactly what we found when we used the drug. In the clinical trials, we took these patients who were in the purple line, having the worst outcome, and did the following. This is outcome data over years for breast cancer. Um, this, this work occurred some seven or eight years ago. Um, this is what you used to get in terms of outcome for all breast cancer patients when they were treated just with surgery. Uh, after uh, 12 to 15 years, 25% of the patients were alive. That means you lost 75% of the patients. Once we started with nonspecific chemotherapy, this is what the curve looked like. So it definitely improved the outcome data for the curve. Um, and so everyone started to get chemotherapy who were thought to have aggressive disease. We added different kinds of chemotherapies in, and they didn't make a big difference and caused some toxicity until we got to a class of chemotherapy called taxanes, and they made a big difference. Um, so that uh, helped us out a lot in terms of improving outcomes. And then we m messed around with the regimens of how we gave these taxanes and did a little bit better, although again, not measurably, and there was a lot of toxicity associated with it. But when we added this antibody, that didn't cause any of the bone marrow suppression, hair loss, nausea, vomiting, any of the problems we see with chemotherapy, and treated the HER2 positive patients. You remember that was the purple curve that had the worst? This is what we see. 
So these, these are data out to seven and a half years now. They've matured to about eight years. And uh, this number actually has been exceeded. We're about 86% uh, uh, patients surviving without any evidence of a recurrence or a problem with their disease. Now that still means we've got a problem with 14 or 15%, 16%. We need to do better. And we're working on that constantly in the work we're doing at UCLA and bringing that into the clinic, working with our colleagues in the community uh, as well as our community outreach programs. We're now working on the other subtypes, the triple negative um, and the hormone receptor positive. I am certainly uh, aware that I'm probably way over time here, so I'll end up by saying that we just have a new breakthrough therapy that was designated by the FDA, not us, as a breakthrough therapy. Um, for the hormone receptor positive breast cancer, that red piece of the pie. Uh, remember, there's a, a lot of women in the dark blue line and the uh, light blue line who are having recurrences um, with our traditional best available standard therapy. We've developed a new treatment regimen to try and reverse those curves, and I'll end on that. This is the preclinical data. But the clinical data is this. In the yellow line is what we were able to achieve in terms of outcome following these women over time with the best available standard therapies. But when we added this new oral drug that they can take um, that doesn't have much in the way of side effects, certainly nothing like what we see with traditional chemotherapy, there is a tripling of the uh, progression-free survival, which is not, if that's the kind of difference we want. We don't want to see two weeks or eight weeks or two months. We want to see a big impact. And the median progression-free survival, meaning not having any problem with the disease recurring, has gone from 7.5 months to more than two years. And we haven't yet hit the median. If you can see from the curves, the 50% point is the median. Uh, in the blue line, we still haven't even hit the median uh, where we start to see recurrences. So this is, we think, is going to get better. And this is now in phase three testing uh, at UCLA and in the community sites that many of you uh, get your care from. So I'll end on the fact that we think we can do even better, um, that we can take this molecular information and develop even more effective and less toxic therapy. Uh, the UCLA labs are working at the whole spectrum of malignancies in the translational laboratory. You see them listed here from breast cancer to lung, colorectal cancer, ovarian, prostate, liver. You can read the slide, pancreas. All of this work is going on to try and identify the right molecular subtypes, to identify what's broken, so we can take this molecular information, the biologic information, integrate it to develop new therapies from discovery to testing to final approval and improvement of outcomes in patients that are meaningful. So again, I'm, I'm long-winded. I apologize. I, I'm sure I went way over. But I wanted to tell you that there's incredibly good news on the horizon for all cancer patients as we use these tools to dissect apart what is broken in the cells that are making them go from a normal cell to a malignant cell and addressing our therapies directly at that. That is what is so-called personalized or targeted therapy that you've heard so much about. And I'm proud to work with a group of individuals at UCLA that were among the leaders in the world at bringing targeted uh, therapy uh, to the forefront. So thank you very much.